Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is the Reboot Food launch webinar. Now, in this webinar, we are going to be telling you all about our new campaign, Reboot Food, our radical plan for relaunching agriculture and transforming our damaging food system. And we're going to hear from some leading experts from across uh, advocacy, from politics and from academia about the food revolution that is unfolding as we speak and has the potential to potentially save the planet or make things worse if we don't embrace it in the right way. Now, we're going to start this uh, round just with some introductions from our speakers, so you know who's there. I'll then give you an idea of what the format is, and then we'll launch into the topic itself. Now, throughout this webinar, I'm going to take you on a journey, hopefully, with our speakers, from the damage that's being caused today by animal farming, to the new technologies of precision fermentation and others that could solve the conundrums we face, and then into the tricky topic of politics, of how we actually translate this possibility in to change. Now, in the final third of this, we're going to go over to questions from the audience as well. Uh, so if you are thinking of questions as you go, even if you've got them right now, as some of you have, thanks for that, please put them in the Q&A section and please upvote them as well. But for now, we'll do some introductions. Uh, so since I'm already speaking, I'll start with myself. I'm Joel Scott-Hawks. I am the Campaigns Director of Replanet. I'm a former coordinator of Extinction Rebellion UK, uh, and I also started a rewilding group in the UK, which is really my passion. Uh, I'm here representing Replanet, and Replanet is a brand new, recently launched environmental charity, and it campaigns for science-led solutions to the big problems we face. Now, one of the big things that we look at that's going to go through this webinar is land sparing. What we want to see is the planet rewilded. And so we're trying to find ways that we as humans can use as little land as possible whilst achieving full human flourishing. That's me. I'll be your host. I'll be asking questions. I'm now going to hand over to Hannah, who will introduce herself. Hello, uh, I'm uh, Hanna Tuomisto. I'm from the University of uh, Helsinki and uh, I'm an associate professor in uh, sustainable food systems. And um, I have actually started to do research about these uh, cell cultured foods already in uh, uh, 2008. So I'm one of the pioneer pioneers in this uh, field, but I have also background in this uh, agroecological farming systems and uh, dietary changes and uh, at my research group we are really looking into the future and uh, trying to compare different scenarios to look at uh, how we could uh, improve the sustainability of food systems in the future and uh, what's the role of these uh, new foods uh, alternative proteins and uh, dietary changes, improvement uh, in agricultural systems uh, as well. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, I'll hand over to George to introduce himself. Thank you. So I'm George Monbiot. Um, most importantly, many years ago, I used to play ultimate frisbee with Hannah, and I'm sure there's a rich conspiracy theory to be developed around the ultimate frisbee ne nexus. Um, in my other roles, um, I've been an environmental journalist and campaigner since 1985. Um, and it's been a long, hard road. I'm um, commonly known as a professional troublemaker. Uh, my latest book um, tackles um, the issues we're going to be discussing this evening. It's called Regenesis, Feeding the World Without Devouring the Planet. Thanks, George. And over to you, Sylvia. Uh, good evening, and thank you for inviting me here. I'm a attorney at law and politician, feminist and vegan. And I've been dealing with uh, human rights, human rights of women in particular for more than 20 years as a lawyer in NGOs assisting victims of violence, as a legislator drafting laws, including the first law on counteracting domestic violence in Poland in 2003. As an academic, my PhD thesis concerned the isolation of the perpetrator of domestic violence from the victim. And um, as a deputy commissioner for human rights in Poland, uh, I'm saying uh, about my path, uh, as a human rights defender, because it was my feminism, actually, that resulted in my veganism. At some point, point, I started to realize that you could not fight for human rights, women's rights, LGBTIQ rights, 
uh, that you could not fight one injustice while accepting or participating in another mm -hmm. because feminism is opposed to injustice and veganism is about the same. So in 2015, I became vegan. In 2019, I entered politics uh, to be more efficient and I won the European <laughs> Parliament elections. Thank you. Super. Well, welcome all three of you. Thank you so much for taking part in this. Um, we're immensely grateful and can't wait to hear more from you. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, just so you know, everyone who's here, this uh, session is being recorded and it will be available online. If you're watching the webinar, uh, you're not being recorded. So if you're in your pyjamas, that's absolutely fine. Um, and uh, it will be made available to you later on. We're getting apologies just to send on. If anyone was here for Gunhild Stordelen, who was our fourth attendee, um, matters have come up at COP27, where she remains, uh, which means she couldn't attend this evening after all. So she sends her apologies. Thank you for that. Now, before I hand over to George to open the attack, um, let's just remember why we're here. This is about the Reboot Food campaign. So if you haven't already, uh, this is a good place to start. Go to www.rebootfood.org, as this is a campaign being run by Replanet to achieve real world political results. And we'll hear more about what we want about those in a moment. So to begin our journey as we travel from the darkness of how much we've damaged our planet through the good technologies and to politics, I'm going to hand over to George, who's going to paint a picture of what animal agriculture and farming has done to our planet. Over to you, George. Thanks very much, Joel, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, it's, it's great to be here at this launch. So um, have you today eaten an animal product, perhaps? Did you have an egg for your breakfast? Maybe some bacon, ham, uh, some chicken nuggets? If so, regardless of what that product was. And if you live in a rich nation, so for instance, within Europe or in North America, the chances are extremely high that that came from a factory farm. Um, between 80% and 99%, depending on which country you live in, of the animal products are on sale in the rich nations come from factory farms. And we have this bucolic image of where, how livestock are produced, of the, the sort of storybook farm with one rosy cheek farmer and one horse and one cow and one pig and one chicken and one cat, and they all talk to each other. Having worked on an intensive pig farm when I was a teenager, I can tell you it ain't like that. In fact, the two thoughts which struck me every single day were, uh, hang on a moment, this isn't what they told me it was about. And secondly, why is this legal? Because if we treated dogs and cats the way that we treat those pigs that I was working with, we would be thrown in prison. So we have this extraordinary double standard, but it also has a massive environmental impact. So the great majority of our food from intensive production. Intensive production means those animals need to be fed on grain. That grain needs to be grown somewhere. Um, it's quite likely, if you've eaten chicken or pork today, that at least some of the grain that fed them was soy grown in Brazil, in the Sahadu um, system or the southern Amazon system, in either case destroying extraordinarily rich biodiverse habitats, savanna habitats and rainforest ha habitats to make way for that. This um, in turn releases a huge flush of nutrients down the rivers, um, feeding into the Amazon, the Tapajois, the Xingu, the Tocantins, um, and those nutrients provided are created by both fertilization and by soil erosion, then flood into the sea. And for six months every year now, as a result of the over-fertilization caused by animal feed growing in South America, there is a continuous band of sargassum weed which runs all the way down from the Gulf of Mexico, down the coast of Brazil, right the way across the Atlantic to the coast of West Africa. It girdles a quarter of the world, and it's a result of growing feed for animal farming. Then we bring the grain over to our own countries, passes through the animals um, in, in these horrendous conditions, packed into factories, uh, these enormous barns, and a great deal of the nutrients in that grain then gets pooped out by the animals, and it has to go somewhere. It's high volume, low value. Farmers spread it on the land. You can't um, uh, economically ship it out of the catchment. And there's far too much of it for soil and plants to absorb. So a large portion of it is washed off the land. It goes into the rivers and it causes exactly the same eutrophication events, i.e. overfeeding events that you get in the places from where the grain came. 
And that then goes into the sea and it causes dead zones at sea. In fact, no river can survive intensive livestock farming. Wherever there is intensive livestock farming, there are dying and dead rivers. And river by river, they are wiping out our aquatic ecosystems. That's intensive farming. So you say, OK, I'm not going to buy the products of intensive animal farming. I'm going to go for extensive animal farming instead. The opposite, pasture fed meat. And all the food writers and celebrity chefs are saying, yes, buy pasture fed meat. That's the way to feed the world. It might be if we had several planets and no space at all on any of them for wild ecosystems, because while intensive animal farming is horrible for the animals and creates this tremendous um, damage by uh, nutrient pollution, extensive animal farming is the land hungriest of all human activities. We complain about urban sprawl, and rightly so. Urban sprawl is very bad for cities and bad for the countryside. But the entire urban area of the planet occupies 1% of its land surface. All the buildings uh, and homes, businesses, infrastructure, 1%. Still too much, but it's just 1%. Agriculture, 38%. 12% of that is crops. Almost half of that land area uh, under crops is used to produce animal feed for intensively reared animals. But all the rest, 26% of the land surface of the planet is used for grazing, for grazing animals. This is a phenomenally wasteful and profligate way to produce our food. And it has a gigantic carbon opportunity cost and ecological opportunity cost. And what an opportunity cost means is the cost of not doing something that you could otherwise be doing if you weren't doing this. And so by occupying this huge amount of land for for pastured animals, we are preventing that land from being occupied by wild ecosystems, which are much, much richer in in, in wildlife, in, in diversity and abundance of species. In fact, the great majority of the world's species depend on wild ecosystems with no extractive activity for their existence and also much, much richer in carbon. And so the opportunity cost of livestock farming more than any other factor is preventing wild ecosystems um, from, um, from surviving and preventing the mass restoration and rewilding of the planet's surface, which I believe is the only thing that will get us through the 21st century. Unless we do that, we can't draw down significant amounts of carbon from the atmosphere, which we now need to do because we've produced too much already. And we can't stop the sixth great extinction in its tracks. If we can do that, we stand a chance. And so does much of the rest of life on Earth. Now, what I'm saying is there is no good way of producing animal products at scale. You can. There are some systems where you can say we have a tiny number of, of cattle, for instance, Um, which helps to maintain what ecologists call an intermediate disturbance regime, wood pasture, for example. And there's examples here in the UK, Netwildland, for example, in the Netherlands, Heldersay Port and various others around the world. But what we're talking about is tiny numbers of animals. And if that was the only way of producing meat, only millionaires would eat it. But those systems, which are only appropriate in some circumstances anyway, a very limited number of circumstances, I believe, have been conflated with livestock production. But it's completely different. It's, you know, you're talking about using a very small number of animals to just create a mosaic of ecosystems. You can't live off those animals. They can't feed any significant number of people. So we live in a world of make-believe where animal production is concerned. If we really got to grips with what it involves, both in terms of animal welfare and in terms of environmental impact, and this sector, the livestock sector, has the greatest environmental impact of any commercial sector, bar none. It comes in top when it comes to habitat destruction, loss of wildlife, extinction, Uh, land use uh, right the way across the board. It is the worst thing we're doing to the planet. It it creates 20% of all greenhouse gas emissions, roughly in that order, around 20%. When you look at those impacts, it becomes clear to us that not only 
can this industry not be sustained unless we are to see the death of a habitable planet, but it also cannot be justified. Thank you. Thanks, George. Um, well, as I said, we would start with the dark stuff. And when faced with this, uh, the prognosis for many environmental organisations has been something called less and better. Uh, let's have a little bit less of this bad stuff uh, and make it a bit more expensive uh, and more extensive, which, as George has outlined, is not a good solution. It just takes up more space. But what the Reboot Food campaign is calling for is something completely different. Uh, we are calling to support a technology called precision fermentation. Precision fermentation is an advanced form of brewing, which today has the capability of producing all the animal products, all the proteins and fats that we get today from animals, but using microorganisms instead. Now, Hannah is now going to speak and do a presentation for us, uh, about five, seven minutes, uh, going into the science, not just of precision fermentation, but the other kinds of food that are unfolding in this food revolution today. So I'm now gonna hand over Hannah to bring some hope into the conversation. Yay, thank you. So I will share my screen. Yes, hopefully you can see it now. Uh, so actually, I'm going to uh, introduce a term cellular agriculture and uh, uh, precision fermentation is uh, one part of this uh, cellular agriculture, but because this is so new uh, field, the terms are, are not uh, uh, so well defined and uh, consistently used. So cellular agriculture means the use of uh, cell culturing technologies for producing agriculture products and uh, similar uh, technologies have been used in uh, uh, pharmaceutical industry, in medical industry and uh, also for producing uh, some detergents and uh, then there are examples of these uh, uh, food uh, industry applications like the, the rennet that is uh, produced by precision fermentation. But um, uh, now these food applications are becoming more common. And uh, the term cellular agriculture uh, is uh, divided to two different groups of products, cellular products and uh, acellular products. And uh, these uh, cellular products are products that consist of the cells that have been cultivated. So examples are, for example, cultured meat, which is made of uh, animal cells, uh, also leather, fur, wood and uh, offal can be produced using the similar technologies. The cellular products also include microbial proteins, so for example, mycoprotein uh, corn, which is um, already widely available in many uh, countries, um, is uh, one of uh, the examples of uh, cellular products, but there are also others that I will talk about a bit later. Uh, then acellular products uh, are those that are produced by precision fermentation. So it means that um, a microbe, it can be a bacteria or yeast, is uh, genetically modified to produce uh, uh, a protein or fatty acid. Uh, for example, milk protein, casein or uh, gelatin, vanillin, omega-3 fatty acids, or uh, ovalbumin, which is the egg white protein. And uh, this um, uh, protein or fatty acid is uh, used for the final pr product, but not the, the cells uh, that are producing these uh, substances. Uh, and uh, then there are also two different uh, groups uh, based on what kind of feedstock these cells use. So, so some of the cells uh, use uh, carbohydrates, so they require a source of glucose, which uh, is uh, generally maize or sugar cane or, or some other uh, crop that um, includes uh, carbohydrates, or it could, could be also algae. But then there are also gas fermented uh, uh, microbes, which are able to use uh, uh, 
carbon dioxide or methane as a source of uh, carbon. So these uh, organisms uh, don't need basically any agricultural land for the production because uh, they don't need uh, any source of uh, sugars. And uh, here is an example of the process of producing cultured meat. So, uh, and here you can also see many different uh, names that are used to, to describe cultured meat. So cultured meat is produced by taking uh, animal cells, uh, muscle cells uh, from the either by using a biopsis uh, from the uh, muscle of a living animal or then uh, uh, also stem cells from the uh, embryo can be taken. And these uh, cells are first uh, multiplied, then they are differentiate differentiated to uh, produce uh, muscle tissue. And after that, they don't anymore multiply, but they, they start to fuse together and uh, build the, the muscle tissue. Uh, scaffolds are needed because the cells uh, like to grow on the scaffold. And depending on the length and the process, the end product uh, could be, in theory, something like a whole meat, but uh, uh, most of the applications at the moment are more like uh, loose cells to produce uh, burgers or, or some other processed products. And uh, some um, Landmarks of the cultured meat development are this uh, uh, burger uh, patty that was uh, presented to the media in 2013 by and produced by the Mark Posts group at the University of Maastricht. And uh, in Singapore, uh, Singapore was the first country to, to give a permission to sell cultured meat as a food in 2020. And uh, these uh, cultured meat chicken nuggets are uh, now sold in a, in a restaurant um, in Singapore. But there are still many challenges in the development of cultured meat to get the cost down. There are many challenges in terms of the, uh, the nutrient mixes, the, the scaffolds, the design of the large scale bioreactors as well. And uh, there is also issue with uh, funding because most of the funding is coming from the uh, private investors and uh, there is very little public uh, money going into the research and in the development of, uh, of cultured meat. So then, yeah, here is an example of the cast fermented microbial protein. So where um, uh, this is hydrogen oxidizing bacteria where the uh, source of uh, carbon is coming from CO2 and hydrogen is coming from water molecule that is split with, uh, with electricity. And uh, then there is the recombinant protein. So this is an example of ovalbumin, which is produced by, by the microfungi. Uh, similar process is also used for producing uh, milk proteins. And uh, yeah, I'm already have taken the seven minutes, but I will shortly show the the uh, impacts, uh, the environmental impacts of these uh, different uh, cultured uh, proteins. So here you can see the uh, beef, poultry, eggs, uh, and uh, milk that are produced in the uh, through animal agriculture, and then there is uh, uh, green peas as an uh, example of uh, plant-based. Uh, proteins, and then there is uh, cultured meat, these recombinant proteins or precision fermented proteins and gas fermented microbes. So you can see that the land use is very low, especially for the recombinant proteins or the precision fermented proteins and these gas fermented proteins. But then the energy use is uh, quite high and especially higher compared to uh, plant-based proteins and uh, and uh, uh, milk and eggs. But then the carbon footprint, the climate impact uh, actually depends on what kind of energy is used for this uh, uh, cell cultured food. So if very low emission energy sources are used, then also the, the carbon 
footprint is, is very low. And even with the current uh, average energy mixes, especially these uh, recombinant, the precision fermented proteins and the gas fermented microbes, they have lower carbon footprint compared to, compared to the livestock products. So I will leave here. Sorry, I took a little bit <laughs> too much time. Super, thank you very much, Hannah. Um, so uh, wrapping that up into uh, an idea for a new food system. So as Hannah's uh, detailed, there's there's, uh, there's different types of this food revolution out there. There are some problems essentially with cultivated meat that mean that they may not be scalable. So although the idea of the lab grown burger is one that's captured public imagination, many obstacles are still facing that. So what Reboot Food has done is essentially distinct, uh, sort of distill many of those technologies and focus on one in particular, which is the precision fermentation. So that is genetically editing, uh, genetically modifying a microorganism like a yeast, and then turning it into uh, uh, using that to ferment animal products. Now, if you want to find out more about those products that are already actually uh, reaching the market, do go to rebootfood.org. Under the precision fermentation section, you can click learn more. And you'll see there that in the US, you can already buy precision fermentation milk. From that, you can buy precision fermentation ice cream. In Germany, they're making precision fermentation cheese, steak, and ground beef and chicken is on the way as well. Essentially, we've unlocked the codes to how to do this. Now, what the Reboot Food campaign calls for is uh, four points. So firstly, we say it has to be plant-based, this new food system. So we should all be eating an abundant variety of foods, uh, of plant-based foods, because that's the healthiest thing. Secondly, we should brew instead of slaughter. So that's, we should use precision fermentation, where we ferment microorganisms, as Hannah's detailed, to make our proteins and our fats. Thirdly, we should use as little land as possible, and we should rewild everything else for the reasons that George has outlined. And crucially, we're saying that farmers and landowners should be supported through this. So they should be paid and supported by government to do that rewilding. And finally, we're saying that those technologies that Hannah has just called for and has just described should be made as much as possible open source so they should be available to everyone so that the development does not end up in the hand of a tiny number of corporations, which is a big risk. Now, on our website, you'll see that there is a manifesto. That manifesto goes into 10 specific policies which we are calling on governments to achieve to unlock this food revolution that could be plant-based and precision fermentation-based. However, as idealistic as writing a manifesto may seem, it's time for a reality check about where politics actually is. So I'm now going to hand over to uh, Sylvia, who's a very experienced advocate in this space, and of course, as you know, an MEP as well. So Sylvia's going to tell us, uh, what's the state of European politics right now? I is it helping a food revolution or is it defending the industrial animal agriculture business? And hopefully you can tell us a bit about your experiences in advocating for change as well, Sylvia. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, actually, I will start with uh, a very short diagnosis and I will probably repeat of what uh, George previously said, uh, but very shortly. Um, we are witnessing the catastrophe and this is the catastrophe on the plate. If uh, you look at the climatic, economic, health and social impacts, there is no bigger political problem than animal agriculture. And this is one giant ticking time bomb. The sector pollutes the environment, destroys biodiversity, causes climate change, the deforestation, increases antibiotic resistance, causes food poverty, turns the lives of people living in the vicinity of animal farms into hell and kills billions of sentient and thinking beings. And we can spend a lot of time here presenting the facts and scientific data indicated uh, in the reports, in the analysis, but we all know this data. And going, going to the politicians and uh, politics, Politicians know the facts too, but they ignore these facts, idly watching as animals and planet die and people suffer. Politicians pretend that animal farming problem does not exist. They ignore the problem, although academics, NGOs, experts, activists call for change. But for now, the lobbyists' voice and political interest are still more important. Politicians ignore the problem because 
it is more convenient. And what is crucial, animal farming is strengthened by both the left, the right, and the liberals. Uh, industry uh, can do its job because politicians do not dare to say that this model of nutrition, this model of the economy, this model of life is a bankrupt. And the only thing saving its existence is public money. And at the beginning, what we need to do, we need to stop funding the industry, animal farming with public money. Isn't it absurd that the, the European Union spends billions of euros on a sector that worsens the climate disaster, destroys biodiversity, turns millions of people's lives into hell, destroying their health? Yes, it is. Because politicians first spend billions of euros on what does harm, and then billions of euros to the effects of the animal farming. And this is absurd, this is uh, inefficient. And it is very obvious that we need to change the system. And this is the system is to be blamed, not the people. And as a lawyer, I wish we could discuss, for example, the drafts of concrete laws. But to change the system right now, we need to push the boundaries of the debate because the debate is blocked by animal farming sector. Currently, I push the boundaries of the debate instead of drafting laws. And that is why in September 2021, I announced my five for animals. Uh, I was the first politician in Poland that proposed a roadmap and specific dates for ending animal exploitation. And my five are 2023, a ban on animals in circuses, dolphinariums, ban on hunting, including fishing. 2025, a ban on opening new animal farms. 2030, a ban on animal testing. 2040, 100% ban on animal agriculture. And now, introduction on animal rights in the constitution. I believe that what is harmful must be first made more difficult and then banned. I say this because I believe that the meat sector is a sector of the past and the sector of the future that politicians should support is the plant-based sector. And that's why I proposed a different package of changes, a 5-4 plant-based uh, sector. And it was a ban on advertising now legal advertising of meat, milk, and eggs. Secondly, elimination of funds for the promotion of these products, a lot of euros. Thirdly, establishing a fund for veganism promotion. Uh, fourth, climate and animal rights classes from preschool education. And the last one, it was 0% uh, tax on meat, uh, dairy and eggs uh, alternatives. I prepared these proposals together with the think tank, Green Ref Institute, a vegan uh, advocacy think tank uh, in Poland. And I support as a politician all solutions and ideas that are that can change the world. For instance, I endorsed plant-based treaty and I keep saying the debate is blocked by animal farming sector. What is more, I keep saying that so-called meat party, a cross party group of politicians from left to right exists in Poland and in the European Union. They fight directly or indirectly in the interests of the meat lobbyists to maintain the status quo, blocking any attempt to change, to conduct a debate based on scientific data or NGOs recommendations. And I'm saying this because, for example, in Poland, when I propose to work together to drive these changes to all political parties in the Polish parliament, no one responded to my proposal. 
And in the European Parliament, for instance, I proposed a draft resolution on the consequences of industrial farms, not animal farming uh, itself, industrial farms. And none of the key political forces supported this proposal. After months of lobbying MEPs to support the resolution on industrial animal farming with a huge support from NGOs, we didn't manage to get enough support at the Conference of Presidents and to add the draft of the resolution to the agenda of plenary session. But to conclude, I often hear the question whether these demands of my fives are realistic. Not now, but should we place them? Yes, because this is, this is the only way to push the debate's boundaries. This is the only way to focus media attention on animal farming. This is the only way to start changing the system to save the planet, the people and the animals. And when I proposed the debate on introducing a meat tax more than two years ago, I was attacked by all the media, media and all political parties. Today, we already have substantive media publications and scientific analysis, and governments of Germany and Netherlands discuss the idea. So if we are interested in real change, if we want to deal with animal rights and not with so-called animal welfare, if we want to tackle the climate catastrophe realistically, we cannot compromise. Thank you and go vegan and stay vegan. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Uh, fantastic. Right. So, uh, Let's let's talk about what's in the Reboot Food Manifesto before we go into uh, a bit of a debate. Um, so you've had some great ideas from Sylvia here. Uh, and one of the notable things, actually, is that we're following a similar theory of change to Sylvia in the Reboot Food campaign, in as much as we are deliberately trying to stretch the window, the Overton window of political possibility. So rather than adopting the strategy that many NGOs have been adopting, which is to let's choose a small win that's slightly better in the right direction and see if we can win that, we're going full out there. We're proposing an entirely new system, as that's as we've heard, that's the state of the emergency. Now, notably, I should say that whilst it's fantastic to have um, Sylvia Long here and a number of us on this call are personally vegan, it's not a word that we're using as part of the Reboot Food campaign, as we're actually thinking that the Reboot Food uh, manifesto can in some way open up the debate about ending animal agriculture with people that wouldn't even want to use that word or even have a meeting with people. So we're hoping to add a new player into this battle in some ways. The other thing to note is that Replanet is also first and foremost essentially an environmental organisation, but it's one that's realised that through this technological breakthrough could essentially become also a, a sort of vegan organisation in some ways. And we're hoping that this is something that will pull the rest of the environmental movement in, realising that animal uh, suffering across wild animals and farm animals can all be part of the same story. So very quickly, what's in the Reboot Food Manifesto? Well, we've got 10 policies. Our first one is big investment. We're calling for 2.5% of GDP to be invested into food innovation. That's a lot of money. That's how much was spent on the moon mission. But as George has outlined, that's the stakes. That's how high we should be aiming. We're calling, as Sylvia has said, to stop subsidies for animal agriculture and to pay farmers a subsidy to sequester carbon instead, so pay them to rewild. We're asking for agriculture to be brought into something called the European Emissions Trading Scheme. Bit technical, but essentially we're asking farmers that emit to pay to emit. We're saying that plant-based foods should be subsidised at the shops. So when you go in there, the price should actually be lower to buy healthy plant-based foods and the government should be putting money into that. It will help so many people by doing this. Now, crucially, as we've touched on, we're calling fifth for a just transition. So this is going to be a huge impact, whether we're campaigning for it or not on farmers and on their supply chains. So governments need to act now on this to help people and to help those communities. We're calling for reductions in land use, so we're targets for those. And seventh, we're calling for a limit to patents on food technology. And our final one's this, we think that gene editing has to be legalized. That's gonna be necessary to unlock the technologies Hannah's talked about. We're talking for sustainability labeling to be made mandatory. So that is to say that you should be able to go into a shop and see if something is a big emitter, a big land use, and if something isn't. And finally, similar to what Sylvia was saying, we're calling for a ban on advertising of animal-based foods that have the highest carbon 
and land footprint. And if you want to read more about that and read the logic behind it, you can go to rebootfood.org and you'll find on there that we've got the manifesto, two pages, nice and quick to read, or the full report, of which I was the lead author, George was a contributor, which is a nice juicy uh, 30 pages instead. So what we'll do now, we're going to run until about quarter two uh, the next hour. So we've got about another half hour late. I'm going to ask some difficult questions of our three panellists. And then you, the audience, are going to get some of your difficult questions asked. Uh, so first one is for Hannah and for George. Um, look, I've I've heard. Oh, actually, sorry. First of all, we've got a poll. Uh, how exciting. Right. The poll that has just popped up on your screen uh, is up for you to vote. So if precision fermentation was available at the same price, would you buy it? This might be a slightly skewed audience, but go for it and keep voting. So let's see how that goes on in. So whilst you're voting on the poll, uh, I'm going to ask a question of George and Hannah. Um, George, first, I have heard extremely persuasively from many farmers I speak to on Twitter that animal agriculture is necessary for soil health and for carbon sequestration uh, and that there's there's no way we can do it without manure. So um, is this a load of bullshit? <laughs> well, it's not entirely bullshit. I mean, we do need more carbon in the soil and manure does is one route to getting carbon in the soil. The problem is that as far as the greenhouse gas impacts of that are concerned, they're massively outweighed by the other greenhouse gases produced by animal agriculture. So in this case, we're talking specifically about either pasture fed meat or about rotational farming using animal manure to grow crops. Um, in both cases, we see a really huge greenhouse gas hit. So when it comes to um, the pasture fed animals, the grazing animals, um, the, uh, the ruminant animals produce methane, um, nitrous oxide is released from their dung, um, and a lot of that can get into the rivers or go into the air as a very powerful um, a greenhouse gas. Um, if, if we have fertilizer for growing crops, in principle, it sounds like a great thing to do because you're just recycling the nutrients and the whole um, principle of organic farming is it's supposed to have a closed nutrient loop. But shockingly, you lose more nitrogen from animal manure than you do from Harbour Bosch nitrogen, artificial nitrogen. And it's bad enough with artificial nitrogen. There's one paper suggesting you lose 37% more from animal manure. And the reason is that its nitrogen release is out of sync with the growth of the annual um, grain crops that we grow, or indeed annual, annual um, vegetables. And so you have to, um, because it's very slow release, you have to spread it before you um, plant your crops. And so it starts releasing nitrogen straight away. Um, some of the nitrogen the crops require will be produced while those crops are in their maximum growth phase, but generally not enough unless you've got really phenomenal quantities of manure on the soil. And then after the crops have been harvested, it continues to leach nitrogen. So it is a way of returning carbon to the soil. Um, the claims that it returns more carbon to the soil than the greenhouse gases animals produce are entirely false. There is no um, a, a empirical evidence of that happening anywhere, which has stood up to scientific, scientific examination. Um, but there are better ways of returning carbon to the soil, particularly using green manures, crop waste, and the rest of it, um, which don't invoke this massive greenhouse gas pulse and do not rely on a system which is so damaging in so many ways, particularly a system that creates so much agricultural sprawl and therefore deprives us of much more carbon rich systems which would be there instead. So just give, to finish off with one very small example, um, the government's own climate change committee in this country shows that um, if you um, uh, turn land from, from pasture to woodland in this country, the soil alone will sequester an extra 25 tonnes of carbon per hectare as a result of that transition. And then on top of that is the carbon sequestered in the trees. So rewilding land, sparing it from animal agriculture, which is by far and away the biggest land use, is a far more effective way of returning carbon to the soil than continuing with animal farming. 
Thank you, George. And Hannah has been doing some interesting research on this. Um, so uh, we'll hand over to Hannah, who's been looking at grass in particular uh, and nutrient cycling back into the soil. So over to you, Hannah. Yeah, so exactly I agree with uh, everything what uh, George uh, said, but then uh, of course uh, in some cases uh, we might want to include grass in the crop rotations if we want to uh, produce crops uh, like for food in that land. And uh, so there are other uses for grass as well than using it only for animal feed or for grazing animals. So, so we could also harvest the, the grass for anaerobic uh, digesters. So basically these uh, uh, biogas uh, reactors and uh, anaerobic digesters, they uh, can replace the cows in a way. So they basically uh, produce um, biogas that can be used as a source of uh, energy, similar way than natural gas, or it can be also used to process for uh, transportation fuel. Um, and then uh, the residue from the anaerobic uh, digestion process uh, is a very good fertilizer. So then uh, that can be applied to the food crops. But now there are also new technologies to uh, extract uh, proteins, amino acids from grass so that uh, we can actually eat the, the proteins. Uh, so before, of course, as uh, humans, we, we are not ruminants, so we are not able to digest the grass. But uh, when the proteins are extracted from the grass, then it is possible. So, so that's, uh, that those technologies are now under development. And then uh, for uh, these um, uh, cell cultured foods, uh, there is also uh, um, application for grass. So, so this grass can be also used as a feedstock for uh, microbes or also the amino acids, the proteins uh, can be used for, for this uh, cultured meat uh, production and also the sugars that are extracted from, from grass can be used as a, a glucose source for, for different types of uh, cell culturing processes. Fascinating. I can hear um, some livestock farmers screaming at this Zoom call that you've just proposed that we start eating the grass. Uh, well, well, we'll let them ferment on that themselves. Um, so our poll is in. We have some very pro-precision fermentation people here. 86% of you say, yes, you would buy precision fermentation products. If you're in the US right now, you can do it. You can go and buy Perfect Day Dairy uh, or Brave Robot ice cream. If you're in Berlin, very soon, you should be able to get uh, cheese from Formo, a precision fermentation company. Uh, cool. OK, so uh, like I said, we've still got about 20, just under 25 minutes left. Um, so another controversial question. This one I'm going to throw to Sylvia first. Um, animal farming is part of heritage. It's part of our culture. It's part of our history. It's part of our landscapes. It's very difficult to think of a rural community that doesn't come into contact with it in some ways. Uh, so surely you know, us people who want to get rid of it, we can, you know, reduce it massively, but surely the government should be supporting some people to continue it for, for cultural and historical reasons. What would you say to that, Sylvia? Uh, can I answer your question by asking a question? Uh, why actually governments should support eating meat? Why they should support exploitation and killings? I believe uh, that a real green and just transformation, a real new order is not possible without veganism. And I know I, I am one of the few politicians in Europe who dare to say this. I'm not supported by the Greens in Poland and by the Greens EFA in, in European Parliament. This is not official positions of the party and the group. Uh, and as a politician, uh, I need to say that governments should or even are obliged to provide all people with healthy and ethical food, all people regardless of where they live, how much money they have. Plant-based food is for the taking. Plant-based food can feed the world. And why not to use the huge possibilities of plant-based food? 
The future is vegan for different kinds of reasons, not only moral ones. And I would like to mention that me and my team just published a white paper on the animal agriculture entitled Blood, Stench and Tears. This is in Poland. And this is the first such comprehensive report showing the effects of the animal farming from the perspective of climate and environment, human rights, including health issues, and of course, animal rights. These are just pure facts and data showing that there are no uh, reasons to support eating meat. Uh, we distribute this book to politicians, authorities, those in power. And of course, as a vegan, I believe that uh, just as we are ashamed of the people who once traded slaves and burned witches, future generations will be ashamed of us that there was a time when animals were eaten. But there are, as I said, uh, more reasons uh, for the vegan future than moral ones. Thank you. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, so we've just got a few minutes left for this section. So um, I'll throw another question out there and we'll start with George for this one. Um, it, I was just at COP27. Um, I met the CEO of one of the big cultivated meat companies. Obviously, we're calling precision fermentation here, not that technology, but similar question. Um, and it, it could have been meeting the start of any tech startup from Silicon Valley, um, had the same monomaniacal vision to take over the world. Um, surely the dangers of corporate conglomeration here of a tiny number of companies owning this technology is so great that actually we should be campaigning against this, not for it. Uh, what do you say, George? That there is a genuine danger here, as indeed there is with most new technology. Um, at the moment, worldwide, intellectual property rights are too strong and antitrust laws are too weak. But unfortunately, that applies to the existing food system as well. So to give you one example, 90% of the global grain trade is in the hands of four corporations. Now, that's a disaster. It's extremely dangerous for global food security. It's extremely dangerous for the resilience of the global food system itself. These companies like the banks leading up to 2008 are becoming too big to fail. But does that mean that we should abandon the global grain trade because of that corporate concentration? No, we need to reform the global grain trade and break up those mega corporations. If we were to abandon it, billions would instantly starve. So what we need to do here is to separate the technology and the remarkable environmental and humanitarian potential of this technology from the possibility of its capture and co-option um, by a small number of corporations. And it's perfectly possible to have distributed and open source technologies which are extremely effective. Um, in, in fact, um, one of the things I do in Regenesis is, is to look at the evidence and uh, the evidence shows pretty clearly that actually weak intellectual property rights have often been associated with very powerful trends in innovation. And if intellectual property rights are too strong, they uh, lead to a fortress um, um, styles of development, which actually impedes innovation. So both um, if we want this technology to thrive, and if we want to prevent the same corporate capture and concentration that we've seen in the rest of the food chain, then we have to ensure that intellectual property rights are weak and antitrust laws are strong. These are human decisions. You know, we used to have much stronger antitrust laws. We used to have much weaker intellectual property rights. But as a result of corporate lobbying, the, these, these um, um, disastrous circumstances have been imposed on just about every sector. We need to be breaking up Amazon. We need to be breaking up Google. We need to be breaking up um, corporations in just about every commercial sector. And that applies to food and farming as well. It's not a new problem introduced by novel technologies. It's an existing problem that needs to be dealt with wherever it occurs. Super. 
Thank you, George. Uh, and this is why in the Rubik Food Manifesto, if you read it, uh, one of our things in there is about limiting patents to 10 years. That is part of it um, as part of a broader package of mitigation. OK, so we're about to come up to the final 15 minutes, final quarter hour of this uh, webinar. Firstly, thank you so much. You can see that uh, so many of you are sticking with us, which is absolutely brilliant. We're so honoured that you're here listening and watching. Um, now, we're going to try something before we go into questions, though. We're going to try taking action right now. We're going to assume that uh, uh, from the polling, many of you are enthusiastic about precision fermentation. Um, so we're going to see if we can crash Twitter all together all at once. Um, so uh, I'm going to post uh, in the chat right now a tweet. Um, hopefully you've all got Twitter and we're all going to take a moment to click on it, open Twitter if you can, quote retweet it and tag any politician that comes to your mind. At this point don't overthink it, it doesn't need to be someone who has influence or power. If you can think of a politician's name tag them in the tweet. So we're all going to take 60 seconds to see if we can crash Twitter with this tweet. Uh, if you haven't watched the video, you're going to have to trust us. It's very good. It's got George in it uh, talking about all of the things we've been talking about tonight. So let's jump onto Twitter for one minute and see if we can crash it. Uh, so tag a politician. Super. Uh, well, um, let's see if that works. I mean, with that, that uh, it's really helpful. Um, uh, to do that for us, for the campaign, um, but also it's an interesting experiment to see whether this is a way of making tweets uh, go more viral. So uh, we'll let you know if your help tonight has had an impact um, and we'll keep you updated. Um, many of you have signed up to our mailing list as well, so you'll be getting an update very soon. Um, so we're going to go with some of the questions that have got the the, the most upvotes. Um, and if I don't ask your question because it's got lots of votes, it's because I think it's already been covered or it might be better addressed elsewhere. Uh, so we're going to um, have to jump into our first question. And I'm going to go for one to address to Sylvia, because I know, Sylvia, you've got to leave in five minutes time. Um, so how can we shift consumer behavior and perception to plant-based natural diets? This seems almost impossible when the food industry is owned by a handful of major corporations. So the question is, this is from Helena, how do, how do you make these diets seem natural? That's the challenge. Hmm. Well, I'm dealing with uh, systemic changes, but uh, a, lot work of, a lot of work uh, is being done by NGOs advocacy NGOs, uh, activists on the streets, attorneys uh, at the courts, uh, and of course, vegan bloggers, uh, vegan chefs, uh, which uh, do a great, uh, a great job. Uh, but to, to do this shift and to make this change, we need to change the laws and public policies uh, to make people uh, to make people make uh, their own choices uh, responsible and uh, yeah, with all this knowledge and awareness. And I know that we need a, a huge pressure for politicians, uh, for decision makers. So this is what you can do uh, to put a pressure for your politician, for your uh, member of the parliament, for your member of the European parliament. And uh, the good news is that I can recall uh, the problems with phasing out coal, very similar uh, discussion, very similar debate. Um, the politicians did the same what they now do uh, with the problem of animal farming with coal and gas based energy for years and for years the coal and the gas lobby has stood for the status quo for years politicians have worked in the interest of lobbyists not the public and fortunately they have to they had to stop it and finally the debate and the systemic changes started and the same cycle will happen with phasing out animal agriculture i am sure we just need to work together and connect the dots between uh, climate uh, catastrophe human rights and animal rights Brilliant answer. Thank you so much. Um, well, Sylvia, feel free to drop out and go to your next meeting when you are. Um, the remaining three of us are going to stay on. So we say a big thank you to Sylvia for fitting us into your extremely 
busy schedule. So thank you for being here um, and we'll follow up shortly. So the rest of us, we're going to be here for another 10 minutes just to answer quick fire a few more questions. We've got another poll going if you'd like to, where we go down a bit more in depth on your opinions about precision fermentation. Uh, is this something you do occasionally? Is this something you would do completely? Uh, next question, and we'll try and keep these ones short so we can get through as many as possible. Uh, challenge to you, Hannah and George, sorry for this. Um, from Julia Milton, uh, there is scientific evidence that human health depends on the health of the gut microbiome, we all know, uh, which in turn depends on eating mostly a range of unprocessed plant-based foods. So how does your call for precision fermentation relate to this other important approach? Um, so basically, essentially, what does the science say? Do we know what precision fermentation will do for our gut microbiome? Is it healthy? Is it safe? Hannah? Yeah, I haven't seen studies of that. And uh, definitely, there is uh, more research needed into these uh, nutritional aspects of uh, cell cultured foods, also the availability of uh, proteins and, uh, and also these um, other issues but the, for for this uh, gut microbial uh, issue i would say that of course like we wouldn't uh, replace all the food with this uh, precision fermented uh, food so it's uh, it's only a, um, a relatively small percentage so so we would still eat uh, um, vegetables uh, that is that are coming from from soil so so then in that sense i don't uh, see that uh, it's a huge issue. Uh, George, do you want to come in on that one as well? Uh, yes, just very briefly. I mean, the protein profile um, of the microbes I looked at in Helsinki, for instance, is roughly halfway between that of plant and animal proteins. Um, the uh, There is an issue in that there's quite a lot of nucleic acids. Um, you don't want too many nucleic acids because they can cause gout and kidney stones, but those can easily be stripped out. I mean, we're not talking about foods which are unlike those we already eat. In fact, you eat bacteria with every meal. And we deliberately introduce bacteria into foods like cheese and yogurt um, in order to create the tastes and textures that, 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 that we like. And so, you know, it's, people say, oh, my God, labs and bacteria equals apocalyptic movie. Well, lab and bacteria equals antibiotics and all sorts of other things, um, including quite a lot of the foods that we all Uh, we lost you there for a minute, George, but I think we got the got most of it. Um, so I'm going to go on to the next question. I'm going to sort of synthesize a few questions that have come up here um, about the global south. Now, in the Reboot Food Manifesto, we make it very clear that this is, a, this is essentially a global north Eurocentric problem that we're dealing with at the moment um, before the technology becomes more scalable. Uh, that is the place that's eating uh, the excessive consumption of meat and dairy. And yet we are also talking about a global revolution. So George, to you, the question is essentially, how does this translate, say, for example, to remote herders in Sudan um, and an, another question is essentially asked you know what about all these people whose farms are the you know two hectares in size um, subsistence farmers what does this revolution mean for them sure well the first thing to say is um, no one's going to be forced to stop doing this I mean we're talking about the introduction of new technologies which of course will be disruptive as all new technologies are I mean that's the point really of new technologies but you know it's not a question of uh, um pushing people coercing people into dropping what they're currently doing um and if they um wish to continue um farming as they farm well that's totally fine you know but we're creating options where people can eat differently and options which will greatly enhance our chances of surviving environmental disaster which is what we're currently facing um, but, you know, there's also, um, it's essential, as, as you said before, that there is a just transition out of animal farming for those who want to take it. Um, at the moment, um, governments around the world spend $500 billion, half a trillion dollars on farm subsidies. And the great majority of those farm subsidies are perversely spent. They go to the richest farmers. They um, are used to, to fund extremely destructive practices. We should be using some of that money to give livestock farmers who want it a soft landing out of the industry and into other activities like rewilding the land, which we would also pay for. If we are spending public money, we should be buying public goods with that money, not public harms, which is what we're currently doing. 
Super fascinating. Um, well, with only six minutes to go, let's open an enormous can of worms. So, Hannah, um, we've got a question from Leonardo. Uh, is precision fermentation another form of genetic engineering? Um, well, I think we, we here know the answer to that, but perhaps you could um, touch on the role that genetic engineering does play in precision fermentation um, and whether uh, every, whether we're all going to get Greenpeace activists scaling our buildings and jumping through the window to stop this webinar right now. Hannah. Yeah, so in precision fermentation, uh, the microbes are genetically modified to, to synthesize the, the protein or uh, fatty acid that uh, we want them to produce. But then actually these uh, genetically modified uh, uh, organisms are not part of the final product because only the, the protein or the, the fatty acid that the uh, microbes are producing are used for the final product. So in that sense, it's uh, it's easier to get the permission for these products in, in the European Union as well. But then it's more of an issue what to do with the microbial mass, because in the US they can use that as a pet food, for example. But in, in Europe, uh, it wouldn't be possible. So here it would go for energy uh, production, most likely. But then, of course, there are these other microbial proteins like corn and these uh, gas-fermented uh, uh, microbes where the whole microbe uh, is eaten. So, so those uh, processes uh, don't involve genetic modification at all. Super. Um, and, and George, it's, it's a complex, nuanced point, isn't it, how genetic engineering is used? Uh, it, it, it's not possible to really be triumphant on one side or the other. What's your take on, on its role? So, I mean, I, I still oppose genetic engineering when it's used to create Roundup ready crops, which are just going to lead to the use of more Roundup, for example, um, when it first kicked off um, in the um, early 1990s in crop um, biology. It was um, ex extremely um, well, um, cavalier in the way that it treated um, consumers and treated the living world. But parallel to this, we have been eating GM microbial products for a long time. I mean, if you eat cheese, the great majority of that cheese is made with um, a product called chymosin, which is um, made from a genetically engineered microbe. And that chymosin replaces rennet, which we previously got from the fourth stomach compartment of a calf. Um, and I think most people, honestly, would, pre pre would prefer to be eating the chymosin than this chemical removed from the fourth stomach compartment of a calf. Um, and it's also been um, used for a long time, um, GM microbes to produce insulin, for instance, also through precision fermentation and a number of other products, enzymes and things, which you know just don't seem to have caused any headaches and don't seem to have caused any public disquiet. So my approach is case by case you know um if gm is being used um just to secure the market position of a super dominant company then it's a bad thing if it's being used to advance a uh, massive massive environmental improvements without um, harming human or planetary health for instance then it's a good thing and we're going to end with one nice question, actually, that's framed a kind of vision of the future that we could be uh, um, fighting for here with our last two minutes. So give quick questions if you can. I'll just quickly update you on our poll as well. So that's really interesting. So 63% of you here, thank you so much, uh, would do a complete swap. So we've got some really uh, sort of pioneering people here. Um, if you go to Singapore or the US, I said, you could start doing that already, hopefully here in the UK too. And 34% of you eat it occasionally. And the 3% of you here who say you'd never touch it, bacteria is gross thanks for coming. I mean, it's just so open-minded of you to come and listen to all of this. Um, and I really appreciate you coming. And there'll be more of these debates coming up. So final question um, is from Daniel Green. And that, that says, um, so 15 to 20% of the population can't afford to eat the eat well plate. That's the UK thing. Um, so poor diet is one of the biggest drivers of mortality and morbidity behind tobacco. Now, would it be possible to have precision fermentation in localised people's kitchens that could truly enable all citizens to access a healthy and climate friendly diet? Um, so it's a lovely vision, the idea of this. Um, could we make it happen? Um, we'll go to George and then give Hannah the final word on this one. Uh, over to you, George. I mean, it's certainly the way I'd love to see it happen. And what I'd love to see is independently owned microbial breweries on the edge of every town, like the sort of microbrewing of 
beer and producing products tailored to local markets, um, high protein, high fat foods, whatever people wanted, um, which either substitute animal products or trigger a whole new cuisine, which is one of the promises of precision fermentation. I mean, just as the first farmers to domesticate a wild cow weren't thinking about camembert, we have no idea what new foods this, this could lead us to. In fact, I think we're going to see a dietary revolution as profound as the agricultural revolution was in the Neolithic. Um, but um, in the meantime, um, there are obstacles to this. It's expensive currently to set up these plants. The price will come down. Uh, there's no question of about that. It's not like um, setting up a silicon chip plant where you have inherently enormously high um, costs, but there will be economies of scale. Quite how it will play, play out, I don't know. But I would, uh, I think one of our aims, one of my aims at any rate, is to get in very early with this technology, to fight the concentration of of, 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 of the industry to fight strong intellectual property rights, to fight for um, strong antitrust laws, and uh, to the greatest extent we can, ensure that this is in the hands of a distributed food system dominated by small and medium enterprises um, generating and selling their products locally. And final thought from you, Hannah. We're uh, right at the end of time. Sorry to speak. Okay, very shortly. So at least I know that the Finnish company Solar Foods is already producing this um, technology for space. So basically, they are small units. So those could be also used in the kitchens. And uh, also at the VTT Technical Research uh, Center in, in Finland, they also developed this kind of uh, small prototypes of uh, uh, cultivating plant cells in these small bioreactors that could be in kitchen. So, yeah, maybe. Mm, fascinating. OK, well, that's a lovely note to end on. Um, so firstly, a massive thank you to our two remaining um, panellists, to George Monbiot and to Hannah Chuamisto. We're so grateful for you to be part of this. Thank you, everybody who's been watching and listening. You've stuck through an hour and a quarter of this, which is more than we said, but it was just so interesting. We had to fit your questions in. Please do go to replanet.ngo. Uh, that's our organisation. And follow us on social media through there. And please share the video as well. And uh, if you've come to this webinar, you will be on our mailing list now. Um, um, you can unsubscribe so you'll get updates from us about the next steps of this campaign so thank you so much for listening and uh, long live the food revolution okay good night thanks joel thanks hannah thank Great you bye. bye 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 everyone